All right, this is On the Markets with Darren Blonsky and Chris Sipes. We are with Sonoma Wealth Advisors. We are going to be talking about the markets and all things interesting this week, at least that nerds like us found interesting this week. Uh, the uh, Before I get started, just a reminder that this is for educational purposes only. What does that mean? It means that everything we're sharing with you means nothing to you other than however you want to interpret it. Uh, but we don't know who's watching. We don't know what your specific situation is. So certainly um, this can't be construed as advice. But this is part of the due diligence process that Chris and I go through each week when we're looking at the economy and at the markets. So this segment on Fridays we do is a review of uh, what we see in the markets and looking at the charts. And uh, we, Chris and I were joking because Chris always dresses up for on the economy and I happen to be wearing a nicer shirt than usual today. So we switch. So you can tell. <laughs> What's my favorite and what's Chris's favorite? My favorite is <laughs> on the market, staring at the charts all day, and Chris likes to talk about the economy. So uh, anyway, we hope you find this valuable and useful. Um, as a reminder, you can subscribe on uh, YouTube. You can also uh, set the notifications so you can be notified when we do go live uh, on either Facebook or YouTube and uh, hear more about what we're up to. So uh, Chris... That's uh, what do you think? What did you see this week? What's your kind of top takeaways on the market this week? So lots of lots of excitement this week. We had a Fed meeting. Uh, we had interest rates break above 160 significantly, seemingly overnight after after the Fed meeting. Uh, we had markets up dramatically, down dramatically. We had the quadruple witching this this week uh, ending today. That's why we which, have a picture of a witch on the thumbnail. Yes. Chris was yeah. like, dude, what's what's with the witch, man? Like, it's not Halloween. I'm like, no, it's quadruple I can't witch. believe I missed that. Yeah, I should have gotten that. It's like, duh. Yeah, so what's the quadruple witching? What, well, what is that? Yeah, like what are we talking about? So at the end at the end of every quarter, it's the third Friday before the end of the quarter when the individual and index uh, options and futures markets all uh, settle up basically. And so there's a lot of movement in the options and futures market and they, they have to close out their positions basically uh, today. So that's why they call it the quadruple witching because normally, you know, there might be an expiration of one or the other, but they never, th this is the only time where they all four uh, expire on the same date. And so it creates a little added fun in the markets on top of Fed meetings and huge interest rate moves. Yeah, I mean, whenever we, we call it kabuki theater when it's Fed week, right? Where you've got Jerem Powell coming out and they're very scripted and talking about their next moves in the economy. It seemed like generally the market loved what they had to say this week, at least initially. The next day, they yeah. got just <laughs> taken out to the woodshed and slaughtered. But, yeah. hey, you know, uh, all in all, I think things still look pretty strong other than in the tech side of the market. Uh, that's where we are seeing some weakness. I'm going to walk you through one chart in the semiconductors. That's looking a little precarious at the moment, and that tends to be a leading market indicator for the tech sector. So we're going to want to watch that closely. Let's go ahead and dive on in to the markets, and we're going to start off where we love to start off, and that is the dollar. And why do we care about the dollar? Because the dollar is what most of the world operates with and functions economically. And we want to watch this really closely because there's been an inverse relationship between um, the dollar and the markets. So what you're looking at is a candlestick chart for those who haven't watched the show before. And uh, you're looking at a daily chart. Each one of the candlesticks that's red represents a period of time in the market when the market's down and the green ones represent a period of time in the market when the market's up. So the candlesticks you're looking at represent a day period of time. And what you can see here is it really was a nothing burger in the dollar this, this week. We just basically traded flat. We're range bound. Uh, although people who like to stare at charts like Chris and I uh, look for patterns and try to identify patterns to be an indication of how things might or might not go in the future. Well, one pattern you can see kind of playing out here is something called a bull flag. A bull flag is a chart pattern that suggests that the market's loading up, it's it's like cocking its gun and it's gonna go higher. And so you can see that move and then this kind of downward sideways, that's, that's the market consolidating 
for next leg up. You can make an argument that that's what you see in the dollar right now. If we see mm -hmm. dollar strength, that could be a headwind for the stocks because it's more difficult for US-based companies in particular to transact around the world if the dollar is more expensive, it's more difficult to export. So that's something we wanna keep mm -hmm. on an eye on. Um, Notice really too there, Darren, year. you see the, uh, the cross up in the 20 and the 50. Uh, so we got the trend line starting to cross up in a positive uh, direction or, or northern direction, I guess you could say. So that's that's interesting. Yeah, so let's talk about trend line. So there's some other colorful lines on the chart. And we when we go live, I try to delete most of the stuff off these charts. Otherwise, it's too overwhelming because we could start putting on all kinds of indicators that are, um, I think, uh, mind numbing helpful sometimes. But really, simplicity is the essence of this work. And when you've got this black line on. So every chart you're gonna look at tonight in the black line, that's the 200 day moving average. So that means that's the last 200 days averaging the price out. And then you've got the yellow line, which is the 100 day moving average, the blue, which is the 50 day moving average, and the red, which is the 20 period moving average, and we call that home base. And those are important because the market tends to respect it. It becomes kind of this social fulfilling process. And when the market hits these certain levels, you tend to find resistance and support. You've also got these lines that we draw on, which are resistance and support lines. If they're green, that means it's support. If it's resistance, it's red. And the market tends to respect and stay in between those as important kind of uh, guides along the way as it moves through um, price discovery. So what is price discovery? It's you know people in the market bidding, hey, I'll buy it for this and I'll sell it for this. And they're bidding with each other. And that's what you're looking at. You're effectively looking at a graphical representation of bid and ask. People saying, I'll pay this, I'll sell for this, and those people coming together. That's the market. And there's lots of ways to look at the market and cut the market and uh, understand the market because it's very complex and there's lots of pieces to it. That's what I love about it. It's uh, kind of this puzzle you can never figure out completely in your the minute you think you've got it kind of figured out, it changes on you. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's this never ending process of trying to understand it. So another indicator on the market we like to really look at is the VIX. Chris, what's the VIX for? So the VIX is the volatility index and it is the market's expectations. Uh, basically, it's the market's expectations of volatility over the coming uh, 30 days. And this week, we've been talking about it for a while. We've been looking for a, a close under 20, 20 being kind of like the baseline of like, this is this is a little bit higher volatility. Now in March, during COVID, we saw 80. Uh, during the great financial crisis, we saw even higher than that. So, but we've been elevated um, over the last year. We've really been elevated in that like 20 to 30 range, basically all year. Um, and we've gotten so close to 20, so close to 20. And I think it was, was it Wednesday? Was it the day of the, the Fed meeting that we yeah, we finished below meeting. 20? We actually closed below. Because I remember I texted yeah. like, hey, the VIX closed below 20. Yes. And you're like, woohoo. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, that's so that's good because prior to COVID, we were trading in like the mid teens uh, on the VIX, which uh, so so you want to see that come down and let the market settle down a bit. Um, and, and but this is kind of a real time indicator. It's not a it's not a leading indicator. It's a it's a real time indicator of of um, investors expectations of volatility. Well, and we, you know, we kind of got that fake out, right? Because we did, you can see where we closed one day below right here on the 17th below that 20 and then boom, next day we were right back up yeah. into volatility and here we closed out the week. And, and I think closes, weekly closes are really important. So you always look at daily closes and weekly closes. So yeah. where the market closes is really important to help us understand what the general trajectory of it is. Midday understanding where it's at isn't as important because there's lots of fake outs that happen during the mm -hmm. day, but where the market closes is very important. Another big story we heard from uh, and has been really impacting the markets, those who are trying to refinance understand them, th this, those in the banking and mortgage industries understand this, but the yield on the 10-year treasury has been skyrocketing. And that's starting to create some kind of blockages in the piping and you're hearing kind of some nervousness in the market because of the yields. And the reason is because if debt's more expensive, it's more difficult for people to transact, to buy, to sell, to rent, to own, whatever. Just that that's the what keeps our consumer-based debt addicted economy alive uh, is what are we paying for that debt? Uh, and that's the American way, right? So 
the, the when rates have gone up as fast as they have, that can kind of create some uh, uh, backup. And we're seeing that. And we saw a really strong move on the 10-year, really strong move on the 30-year. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, Jerome Powell and the Fed are saying, look, we can control this. And they're going to probably try to control this. We don't know yet through something called yield curve control and keep that down because we don't want the rates to go too fast. But what the market is effectively telling the Fed, and we saw this happen and play out yesterday on Thursday, is they're telling the Fed, look, you guys are full of it. You don't know what you're doing. Because they're saying we're keeping rates low until 2023. And the market's saying, yeah, watch us push rates higher. Right, mm -hmm. so it becomes one of the. I remember the you know Chuck E. Cheese, Chris, and you, you have that bump up game where you like hit those things. That yes, pop up. whack them all. Whack them all. That's right. So I yeah. imagine like yield curve control, like whack them all. Right? Yeah. So the Fed's like trying to hit rates and yield curve control before it just it just gets overwhelming. So yeah, it's not. It's not something with a lot of precedence of success, put it that way. Well, they've been controlling the shorter end of the curve, so so the, the shorter term bonds, but they don't you know, have as much control over the longer term. That's more market driven. And you can see that we're, we're getting back to the same areas we were at prior to COVID, to the sell off in COVID. And during the worst- above it on the 30 year. You can see yeah. close this week. And during the worst part of COVID, we got to, I think, all-time lows on the 30-year. We were below 1% on the 30-year bond. Um, so just crazy low levels. Um, so, so that's a good sign uh, of healthy, you know, healthy market behavior, basically. Um, however, like you said, if it moves too quickly, then all of a sudden the, the cost to borrow is moving really quickly and it's hard for the market to digest that. But it's, it's sort of like a reset button. This has happened a lot of times before. And I think the, the standard like historical outcome has been there's been some volatility in the markets as it digests these new rates, but then markets tend to move on and uh, once the, the new environment is kind of set. Right. And so Powell coming out and saying, we're going to keep an easy monetary policy. Uh, he basically said, we're going to leave the punch bowl out till everybody's stumbling around. We're not going to take it away, you know, but while everybody's a little tipsy, we're going to wait till they're stumbling before we take it away. That's why my post, I don't know if you saw it, but I refaced Santa with Jerem Powell's face and I said Christmas in March. That was my post <laughs> on Twitter today. Because oh, that's that. kind of how it is, you know. And the so getting back to the volatility, one of the volatility indexes, we talked about VIX, which is uh, tied to the volatility of um, the stock market. The, mm -hmm. There's a bond volatility index too. And so what we're watching here is that constipation in the, the bond market, not to make it too... <laughs> Whoa. But, uh, you can see like before COVID when it started building and then when it really spiked, we're watching for these spikes and wanting to see them settle down. And what's interesting about this chart pattern is it's kind of building pretty... I mean, you can see it's not letting go of the volatility in the bond market like you would want to see settle down right here. So that's mm -hmm. something to keep an eye on, right? Because... The, as you've heard me say on this channel many times, the bond market's much larger than the equity markets. And if the bond markets get too messed up, then uh, that will definitely spill over on some level to um, the mm -hmm. uh, equity market. So interest rates and bond prices have a pretty strong inverse correlation. So interest rates go up, guess what goes down? Bond mm -hmm. prices. So mm -hmm. basically bonds have been getting slaughtered uh, over the last many weeks now, uh, this is not looking so pretty for the bond index. Uh, not so looking is, great, but you know, the thing is to keep in mind is the bond, the volatility in the bond market is much, much more muted than the stock market. So uh, the, the quote unquote slaughter in the bond market, you're talking about a few percentage points versus <laughs> slaughter in the stock market is, you know, you're, you're having an emotional experience when there's slaughter in the, in the stock market. Right. <laughs> the bond market, you're like down a few bucks. Yeah, it's OK. Yeah, that's a right. Deal, right. That's slaughter. Exactly. So, you know, just... what's interesting on this. That, that's a good frame of reference for sure. So looking at a longer term chart pattern, let's look at the weekly chart on egg. It's kind of interesting here, but you might have a head and shoulders pattern forming. So a head and shoulders pattern is a very kind of um negative but you can have an inverse head and shoulders which can be positive and if you have a head and shoulders that's negative and so like this would be the right shoulder this would be the head and this would be 
or excuse me, this left shoulder head, right shoulder here. So if we get this kind of rates all of a sudden go down and then we get this kind of movement and then this would be your neckline right here and we break below that, that could be fairly painful. But keep in mind, I'm talking about $10 on the egg and rice yeah. there. So yeah. that's something to watch out for, but there definitely looks to be a pattern. You know, just for a frame of reference, when people ask what happened in March, even the bond markets were so messed up. Like, look at that movement in the bond markets in, you know, a few weeks. That's like three weeks right there. That yeah. was just extreme. All right, let's take a look at the stock market. So we're looking at the um, US 2000. So this is the weekly chart you're looking at. We're well above the 20 period moving average on the weekly chart. You can see we've sold off. These are these small caps full of zombie companies. Uh, these companies are very impacted by dollar moves, interest rate moves. Uh, we look at the daily chart. You can see it looks pretty healthy. Look, we traded right into our 20 period moving average today. We found support right there. And this has been a real important uh, 20 period moving average all throughout this rise here over the last um, few months. And we traded yeah. right into that. So I don't see anything to be concerned about in small cap right now. Uh, just a nice price discovery into the 20 period moving average would make plenty sense. Uh, if we lose a 20 period moving <clears throat> average, uh, then we might get more interested in opening an eyelid there. If we look at the S&P 500, same story. Uh, was kind of a slaughter the last two days. Uh, and we just traded into our 20 period moving average, found support. You can see right there on that red line, there's that support. We traded right up into it. Uh, nothing really to be concerned on the S&P 500. If we're looking at the NASDAQ, which is the tech stocks, it's a different story. And you can see we closed below our 20 period moving average. We traded up into it. We couldn't hold it and lost it. We found resistance at our 50 period moving average, which is that blue line there. Not such a great sign. Although we're still holding our 100 period moving average. There's, if we lose that 100 period moving average, there's a fair amount of market structure support right in here. My, you know, if we keep losing this, my guess is we find support right in that hundred, that two hundred period moving average, and, and historically, you know, the, the stock market likes to check in on the Nasdaq. All the markets like to check in with the two hundred period moving average, so that wouldn't be shocking. But this is starting to look like we might have a downtrend forming um, a persistent pattern that might be a trend change. It's too early to call. You could also say there's a triple top here. There's your head, shoulder, head, another shoulder. Uh, there's your neckline. So if we lose the 200 period moving average, that could be not so uh, good for the market. If we take Fibonacci lines, which are a way we look at um, retracements. So when the market makes a big move, Fibonacci lines are basically a way we measure where we expect to see a bounce. If you imagine like a rubber band expanding and then slapping back together, you can see that sell off and then that bounce up. It's kind of the dead cat bounce is another way to, I always feel like I'm going to get like hate mail from cat lovers when I say that. But <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, no cats so, were harmed in the filming of this video. That's right. <laughs> that's right. The, uh, so we tend to see the market either trace to this 38.2, the 50, which is actually not a fib line, it's just a retracement line, or the 61.8. And I won't go into all the really boring nerdy math stuff behind it. Bottom line is it tends to move in this pattern. And in this scenario, let me just adjust this a little closer for people looking. So you can see we moved down here, right? And we moved down, we found support, we moved up, and notice we traded right into the 61.8 and lost it. That's not a good yeah. sign. That tells me that we're probably gonna see further selling uh, in the NASDAQ uh, and very, very likely we're gonna start hanging out here somewhere and might find support there uh, because we lost that 61.8. There's a lot of resistance there. That's a place where you want the bulls to step in. You, If the bulls lose that, then the bears are in control. And I would say right now in the tech stocks, the bears are definitely in control. I wanna show you SMH, which is the market leading indicator for uh, the tech side of the equation. And you can see, so it's the semiconductors. And there, if you look at the pattern, you can see really a head and shoulders pattern playing out pretty clean, right? So we're gonna really wanna watch this area here next week um, with SMH. That could be a sign 
that things are ready to sell off and correct further. Wouldn't be shocking to get a test of that 200 period moving average. Notice we haven't touched that since uh, May of last year. It's been mm -hmm. a long time. Mm -hmm. So wouldn't be shocking to see the 200 day moving average get touched and support be found there. But you've got that head and shoulders pattern. That's a negative pattern. You've got that downward trajectory. You have that neckline potentially coming in contact there. We'll see how next week plays out on that market, but I don't like the tech stock. I'd say that area, that's the area that I feel like we have the most headwind. Now, why is that so important? Why do we care? It's just the tech stocks, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, but they make up the biggest portion of the S&P 500, which is a what's called a market, uh, market cap weighted index, meaning that the bigger the company, the bigger portion of the index it takes up. So you can see on this map, you know, Apple, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, Tesla, they all make up a huge portion of the S&P. Some of them, like Apple, make up as much by the, by itself as total industries within the S&P 500. So they're absolutely the generals. Um, I, I, I think the earnings of of the tech stocks, the fangs last year were somewhere around like 20 to 25% of the overall S&P, which is why they've become so concentrated because they, they just so happen to make up about 20% of the S&P 500, you know, so it does follow the earnings. And, um, and so, you know, maybe it's an earnings story that these other companies is that other companies are starting to, to gain momentum in their earnings. I don't know, but um, there is absolutely a phenomenon in markets called mean reversion where, you know, the first shall be last and the last shall be first, right? And that just that just is maybe not a law of nature, but it's pretty close within markets. And that's why we were pretty critical in December when Tesla got added to the S&P because it's such a big company in the S&P. And mm -hmm. when it's pre profit or pre it's not pre-revenue but it's pre-profit company uh you, these big tech companies start selling off all these other companies have to do a lot of work but if you've got dollar up and you've got interest rates going up those are headwinds for all these smaller companies that are having to do a lot of heavy lifting in order to keep up with the text the, the falling tech mm -hmm. stocks mm -hmm. So it's pretty important that these tech stocks keep participating. Um, so one index to look at is the FANGs, uh, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. So this is an index made up of those big dogs in the S&P. And you can see it's been pretty flat in that land since last September. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of trading sideways. And one argument you can make is that they moved so fast last year that they're just stalling out so the other companies can catch up and then the market can move forward and pace forward for the next. I think that's probably more likely right now than some big sell off just because, you know, I do think that the, the Fed, until they tell us they're not going to step in, they keep telling us they will step in. So we should assume they will step in. Uh, right. So go ahead. But, well, you have you have you have a couple of things. One, they're great companies. They make a ton of money for the most part. Um, and, and that's all well and good. But you have to remember that there's the pricing factor. I know that fundamentals don't really matter anymore, supposedly. But when you when you Duh. take a company like Apple that goes from a price to earnings ratio, you know, in the mid teens up to over 30, it's basically, uh, you know, investors just paying more for those same earnings. Right. And so so you get you get changes in the the prices that investors are willing to pay for those same earnings. They can they can go up. They can also go down. You know, if you think about your house, wherever you live and it's like if somebody came in and offered you 50,000 for it, you probably wouldn't take it. But if that same person came and offered you 5 million for it, there's there's somewhere in between where the value makes sense, right? But there's also prices where it just, this is crazy, we should unload it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, IWM, we already went over Russell, so that's just traded into its 20 found support. That all looks decent. Uh, we went over SMH and DJT. Those are your three marketing leading indicators. Dow Jones Transportation and Dow Jones Industrial, I think those are your real mm -hmm. kind of shiners. They're doing really well. You can see, I mean, that's a strong market. There's nothing wrong with that sell-off there. 
that all looks really healthy. Uh, you know, if you look at Dow theory, that would suggest that um, all is good and that, you know, the tech stocks are just kind of correcting and consolidating and letting the rest of the market catch up. So mm -hmm. nothing really to worry about. Did get an interesting sell off in energy. We, we lost our 20 period moving average, which, uh, you know, it happened back here in February a little bit. Uh, and it happened back in here in December. So it's nothing to really get too worried about. Notice the 50 was support there, but it is a pause pullback from this huge move. If we step back and look at energy on the weekly, you can see it's been quite the ride on energy as of late. And this is what I'm talking about catching up because if you compare this to tech stocks that were moved up like that, uh, energy stalled out. What's interesting about this though is it's pretty bullish because on a longer term chart, let me get rid of some of this um, <laughs> scribbling here. And if we look at it on a weekly chart, you can see there's a pattern of a long term double bottom right there. You got your neckline right here and this move right here we should expect to see something similar on that. So based upon that chart pattern, you would the probabilities are higher that we're gonna see more move up in the energy sector. Uh, XLF, which is the financials, when rates go up, that's good for banks. They make money on the spreads. They bar take your money, give you nothing for it, and rent, give it to someone else for a lot more. And they make money on the difference there. And when, when interest rates are up, it gives them more spread to play with. And you can see we've sold off, but nothing from a chart perspective that I'm terribly concerned about at this point. Copper, we call it Dr. Copper. Why do we do that? It's, it's used in a lot of the uh, economic, you know, houses, cars, everything. So that when there's higher economic activity, it, t it tends to uh, be a high demand on copper. And so they look to look at it as one of the leading indicators. If there's a lot of demand in copper, typically that that means the economy is is doing better and markets that should therefore do better when you can see in dr copper here in that trade down and we're kind of sideways that chart pattern right there looks a lot like a bull flag to me mm. so you can see kind mm -hmm. of that consolidation period of time where it kind of sells along here and then find support and then we see a move upwards uh, mm -hmm. Let's take a quick look at gold and Bitcoin and silver. Um, gold found support this week. It's been beat up to the shemise of Mr. Schiff. Um, I always like to Dave <laughs> Schiff because I think he's just so out of touch and he's so like doggedly, you know, oh no, gold, gold, gold. And so anytime I can, I can just dig. I'm like, dude, it's, it's just an asset class, man. <laughs> Get rid of your love for it. Um, so the, uh, <laughs> anyway, we closed up above our 20 period moving average. Um, which is good. And for those who don't know, Peter Schiff has like been pushing gold on everybody and selling it to people for a long time. And, you know, it's not doing well. So he's obviously pretty mad. But I really dislike all the gold people. You know, as soon as there's chaos in the world, they come out with big front page ads on newspapers and say, buy gold. And they scare everybody. So they buy gold. And then when it's not doing well, when there's chaos in the world, they're just pissed and they're mad at bitcoiners right now but mm -hmm. uh, well it had a huge year last year you know yeah. so it's kind of going along with the tech stocks i mean gold and tech last year those were the those were the winners that's what everybody wanted to hold and the pattern in gold looks very similar to what happened in tech stocks only there's been more of a sell-off in gold whereas tech's just kind of stalled out basically but you, you saw a similar topping there right in around september yeah. and since then they've both been struggling that's I do interesting. like this pattern, though, from a long term. I mean, that looks like a pretty strong bull flag to me. So mm -hmm. people who aren't, you know, that can hold gold for a longer period of time, that looks pretty good um, from mm -hmm. a pattern standpoint. I don't think that there's anything I'd be really, really worried about. You look at it on the weekly chart, it looks even better. Um, look at it on the annual monthly chart, or I'm not worried about that at all. That's a, Each one of those candlesticks represents a year. To me, mm. that just looks like a long-term, very bullish chart mm -hmm. for gold. Mm -hmm. You just have to deal with the weakness that you're getting right now, and that might take three yeah. years. <laughs> you know? yeah. So it's all about patience long-term. Uh, let's take a look at Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin is um, just, to me, looks like it's building up. You can see it's doing the same kind of um, uh, bull flag pattern right there that's been on for a while. We're still in the... You know the bull cycle of the having so you can see this is a good example of a 
bull flag, you can see it consolidates, it moves up, moves up, consolidates, moves up. And so that mm -hmm. pattern looks pretty healthy. Um, I think nothing that I'm concerned about on that market there. Um, and we would be <clears throat> remiss if we didn't look at GameStop oh. because that's just... You put it at the yeah. bottom so I wouldn't see it. That was sneaky. <laughs> I snuck it in. <laughs> and, uh, you know, GameStop had a hard time getting it together this week. Uh, you, so going back to our Fibonacci lines here, and you can say, okay, well, here's the Fib retracement lines. And look at that. It gave up at 61.8. Couldn't make it back above. Then closed below its 38.2. That's not looking so good for my Game Boy or GameStop friends out there. Um, but the, uh, you know, what's interesting, a lot of the Reddit uh, crew were calling, oh, it's going to 300 today with the quadruple witching. I'm like, no, I don't think it is. <laughs> I think from a chart pattern, that doesn't look so good for those ones. AMC did open up, um, which was another one of the short stocks, and they opened up their theaters this week, and they're struggling to get under the 60, get above the 61.8 retracement line. But you can see that's still not that bearish because they're holding on to it right below it. And I think that's what we got. Let's take a quick look at um, Tesla. Tesla looks decently healthy we had a pretty strong sell-off but then we had that move up um you know you could argue that that's just a bull flag in the making a little bit low for the bull flag but maybe we'll see how it plays out chris anything else you got as we wrap it up for the week no i think that's a that's a good wrap um i think i think just to you know kind of sum it up it's we saw a lot of movement in the markets but really in terms of the technicals nothing looks too too unhealthy at the moment and most of these things are just kind of correcting back to their their home base so to speak and um you know we'll see what uh we'll see what the next week holds yeah it's all it's always a bit of a we'll we'll see what this week holds these days but mm -hmm. uh yeah i would say generally that's the look of the markets right now they just they look like they're doing their thing and there's price discovering they look healthy i don't see anything that's immediately of significant concern. Well, that's mm -hmm. a wrap. Have a great weekend, everyone. Enjoy the beautiful weather and we'll talk soon. Take care.